do, which is to share my joy um, of teaching with you and to give this award, this a lecture. So what I'd like to do is tell you what I've learned from walking and running. And this is walking and running um, with students. And so I'm going to share with you nine stories today. And there's stories about different students that I've had. And in sharing these stories, I hope to share and give you a sense of my teaching philosophy and what I think is critically important in the profession of teaching. So the first story is a story um, about a woman named Emily Zittick. And in the second year of teaching at Rice University, I've been at Rice probably uh, 18 years. So when I first got there, um, they offered these classes called Hewlett Packard classes. And it was an opportunity for teachers to get together with teachers from other disciplines and to um, pose a class that would be for freshmen that would be interdisciplinary in nature. So I got together with um, these three other professors at Rice. One was in political science, one was in um, linguistics, and one was in French studies. And we decided to teach a class on persuasion. And in this class, we taught about persuasion from our four different perspectives. And what we had the students do at the end of the class was to come up with some project in which they could make a persuasive appeal to us. And it could be something that was a commercial, it was an advertisement, it was a reproduct of something. And we had the most incredible things. These were freshmen at Rice University. This was one of their first classes and it was this amazing experience. I'm gonna tell you about a couple of them. One, there was this um, campaign to change the name of Nutella. I love Nutella, but Nutella doesn't really sell that well in the US. It sells really well in Europe. So one of the students was like, we just need a new marketing campaign, and it was really good. Another one was this project about um, electing Dianne Feinstein as president. And it was so good and so convincing. It was done by this woman named Emily. And she was this, you, you could see that she was this burgeoning feminist at a very young age, and she wrote about how this would be the president, this would be the first female president, this would be the president for everyone. It was so compelling, and I just looked at this woman and I thought, you are gonna be really, really good. So the third project that I'll tell you about was this project called the Cow Patties. And this, compared with the other ones I just mentioned, was horrible. Okay, so it was these two, it was composed of four people. It was these two meathead football players, and I'm not saying all football players are meatheads, but these two were quite meatheads. And there were also these two women who were kind of quieter, and they just went along with these guys, and they basically decided what they were going to do was advertise a singing group called the Cow Patties. And so they put this black stuff in their teeth and they put overalls on and they sang a, a promo song. And to our horror, it was about being in the bathroom. It was bathroom humor. And it was about farting. And so the three other professors and I just kind of looked aghast, no pun intended, just what is going on? So we gave them a very bad grade. And you know, to this day when we see each other, if we see something and we'll say something about the cow patties, one of them is, also lives in the dorms. And so uh, later on after the class ended, I really thought, you know what I need to do? I need to get that um, Emily from the Diane Feinstein group and I need to invite her into my lab because she's really going to be something. So after the class ended, I sent her an email and I said, you know what, what I'd really like you to do is come to my office and meet and join my lab. Would you be interested in doing that? And she said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. That would be great. So she shows up to my meet, well, I'm going to the meeting where she's going to show up, and about the same time, one of the cow patty girls shows up. 
And I said, hi, hi, I have a meeting. Can I help you? And she said, well, yeah, I'm Emily, and, and I'm supposed to meet with you. I had mixed up the Emily of the Diane Feinstein with the Emily of the cow patties. And so I had invited the cow patty Emily to come join my lab. So what could I do but just to say, OK, uh, this is how it's going to be. Join the lab. That's great. We'll just come aboard. <laughs> And during the four years that I had Emily, um, she worked on research. She did a senior honors thesis with me. It got published as an undergraduate in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. She applied to graduate school and was accepted into Stanford, where she went. And she is now a professor at Cornell University, where she is close to getting tenure. Now, um, is it possible that Emily from the cow patties would have succeeded no matter what she had done with her life? It's really possible. So I'm not going to say that it was this chance encounter that necessarily changed her life because there are no controls in life and we don't know that for sure. But I do want to instill upon you two um, important lessons in telling you this story about Emily. The first is that you have the power to change lives as a teacher. You have the power to shape people's lives in insane ways. And it's my hope that many of you realize this and hold this as a very important um, utility or tool and, and have the knowledge that you have this. You can shape people. And I hope you're cognizant and respectful of this and think about when you have the power to exert or not exert such power on people. You can crush them and you can build them up with simple actions that you choose to do or not to do. And of course, with Emily, the second lesson, of course, is that even cow patties have potential. Now, the second story, uh, and this is a quicker one, is about Larry Martinez. And this is Larry, and uh, long story short, he's now very, very successful, and he's also well on his way to becoming a tenured professor at Portland State, and um, he is probably the hardest student I've ever had. He was my graduate student, and this guy right here took years off of my life, and he knows it. <laughs> He is the only person who ever made me yell at a student. I actually have done that twice now. <laughs> so one time in his fourth year of graduate school, he decided that he was going to drop out and become a kickboxing instructor. And it was then that we had our first of a series of come to Jesus talks. Okay, now I'm going to tell you, uh, this is going to sound a little religious. There's going to be some themes in this talk that seem a little religious. It turns out I am Catholic. My dad is one of 17 children. I have 55 first cousins on one side. And I have just spent... Um, a semester at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, because that award that um, uh, Margaret talked about required me to spend a semester at Baylor. And when I did that, the president of our university said to me, what? If you win the award, you have to spend a semester at Baylor? If you lose, do you have to spend two semesters there? <laughs> and so, I was at Baylor, and Baylor is a very Christian school. So I have a lot of thoughts in my head in reflecting on students that have a Christian theme to it. So bear with me. Um, so Larry. So Larry says to me, yeah, I want to drop out, and I want to be a kickboxing instructor. What do you think about that? And as you know, if you have four years of a graduate student, and the graduate student decides that that's how they're going to reward your four years of trying to improve their writing and trying to like reason with them as they move from an adolescent to an adult. And you know, I just yelled. And I said, we're going to have something that my colleague, Margaret Beyer, taught me, which is a come to Jesus talk. 
So I had this come to Jesus talk. It basically was me yelling at him and telling him the ways of the world. And, uh, you know, every time I, I yelled at him, I think I, taught, I yelled at him in total of three times. And every time I'd yell at him, I'd get so angry. And he'd look at me and go, yeah, you're right. Wouldn't be bothered at all. I was the one that was really agitated. But um, at the end, when he graduated, I think he knew that he uh, owed me something. And I just want to say he delivered because his sister went to Southern uh, Miss and went to the same church as Brett Favre. Now, I don't, I'm hoping you all know who Brett Favre is, okay? And I am from Wisconsin, so Brett Favre is better than Aaron Rodgers. And upon the graduation of Larry Martinez, he handed me an autographed football from Brett Favre that his sister had gone up to church and asked Brett to sign for me. So clearly, clearly what we know is that come to Jesus talks can be wildly effective. Now, again, I really want to credit Margaret with this, so I have to do a footnote. This is a thank you to Margaret Beyer. As you can see, when she first came to Rice University, she taught me about these come to Jesus talks. And she also taught me a few other things. So along the way of having students teach you and learn lessons, um, you can also learn them incredibly from your colleagues. And so it is with Margaret that she also taught me uh, Midwestern philosophy and particularly Minnesota talk. So I'd love for her to be up here, but I'll just give you a couple of these nuggets. The first one is when people in Minnesota say, oh, that's different. What they really mean is, I hate it. And the other one that I'll share with you, and there's a whole litany, and Margaret delivers them much better with her nasally Minnesotan twang, is, you know, some guys might shovel the snow downwind, <laughs> which translates to, Christ, you're an idiot. Okay. <clears throat> is that good? <laughs> okay, third student is Chuck Baker. So I'm 28 years old. I'm just starting my first semester at Rice University. It's day number one, and I'm teaching my very first class in this new job. I have about 75 students sitting in front of me. Uh, the class is Introduction to Social Psychology, and I decide to give credit where credit is due, so I introduce them to the father of social psychology, which is Kurt Lewin. And I'm telling him about how Kurt Lewin believed in the theory as well as the application. And I want to instill this really like strongly on the students. So I say, here's this Kurt Lewin quote. Um, it's, there is nothing so good as a practical theory. And I look up because there's a hand, middle left, and teacher. And I said, yes. And he had his little name tag in front of him. So I'm like, yes, Chuck. He says, well, I remember on page 14 of the book, it says that Kurt Lewin actually said, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. <laughs> and that was my introduction to teaching and to Rice University. OK, they really are smart. And Chuck is really a pain. So he is sitting there in my class. And he's got, if you can kind of see it still, a smirk. And so every day he has the smirk, sits there, middle row, left. And he has this smirk that says, I'm going to watch you and catch you and slip and find your slip ups all semester long, little Miss New Teacher. Okay, so I'm basically kind of talking to him throughout the semester, making sure when I do quotes and just making sure everything is, you know, I'm, I'm dotting my I's and crossing my T's. So I overhear some of the other teachers talking about, you know, annoying students. Um, not that we do that regularly, but every once in a while. And they're like, oh, yeah, we have Chuck Baker, Chuck Baker. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have Chuck Baker. And he raises his hand, and he's always smirking at me. And sometimes he leans over to these two gals on either side, and he'll go, pss, 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 pss. And then he'll look back at me and smirk. And I'm like, I know you're talking about me. I don't know what I did, but blah, blah, blah. So next semester, 
I'm done with Chuck Baker, and I have my new class. It's called Psychology of Gender, mostly taken by women, so I'm feeling very good. And I look out, left center, Chuck Baker. Okay, we go through the same thing. Next class, research methods, Chuck Baker. Okay, so he takes all my classes, all four of them. So finally, we have a pizza party. It's for the majors, and I show up, and I say to Chuck, who's there, he comes over to say hi with a smirk, and I go, Chuck, why do you always keep showing up in my classes? What's the deal? And he looks at me, and he goes, oh, Dr. Hebel, you're my favorite professor. And I'm like, I am? And I just kind of melted. <laughs> and I was like, it's a handsome smirk. Look at that smirk. He's a handsome guy, OK? So when Chuck graduated from Rice, I learned that he donated money in my name. And he became an investment banker in San Francisco. And he'd send me some, every once in a while, he'd send me an email. So when I did my sabbatical at Stanford, I looked him up. And we did biking on Angel Island together. And I forgot to tell you, when he graduated from Rice, he brought his 90-year-old grandmother over to meet me. Today, Chuck Baker is a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. He has, he's married, he has two kids, and we are still in touch. And um, what I think about Chuck Baker and what I think he taught me is you don't always know which students you are influencing. So sometimes it's the really obvious ones. It's the ones that are your research assistants or who do honors theses with you or score the highest in the class. But sometimes it's the person in the back and not the front row. And sometimes it's the quiet ones. And it's sometimes the people who are not doing particularly well in your class. Sometimes it's the people who you think hate you. And, and sometimes it's the Chuck Bakers sitting in that left center seat. So I want you to just remember, you really don't know. First of all, you have the ability to change lives. But second of all, you don't always know which ones are going to be changed. The next students are uh, fourth and fifth are Katie Wong and Juan Madera. And I can't help but smile when I look at some of these pictures. These are uh, pictures of, of people who are like children. So for Katie, Katie, as you might be able to see, is blind um, entirely since the age of three. I asked her if she remembered what uh, colors were or anything, and she says she has a vague recollection of light. So imagine going about your daily business without your vision. Really think about that without knowledge, and then think about wanting to pursue a career in psychology like you do. Think about doing research. What would it be like to do SPSS or R? I don't use that yet. Um, what would it be like to write a paper and to run subjects? And what would it even be like to go to a class and take a class? And how do you take notes? And how do you, how do you rehearse those notes? What is that like? What I can tell you is that Katie changed my teaching style that semester, the first semester I had her. So I used a lot of pictures, graphs, and even an occasional cartoon. And I learned how to talk them out. So at first I, I felt kind of silly because I'd say, well, here's a picture of somebody bouncing a basketball. And I kind of had this thought of, these people are probably thinking, what, and we can see it's a basketball. But what happened was I really got used to it very quickly. The students got used to it. I stopped worrying about whether it seemed weird. It just became very natural. And it was because it allowed Katie to participate. So we had active learning exercises. I sent uh, the TAs her way to let her participate as well. And uh, for not having a vision, um, Katie had more vision than all of her classmates. She literally scored the highest in the classes that she took with me. She took a graduate level course as an undergraduate and outscored them. You know, I thought, how's she going to run subjects? How's she going to analyze the data? She did a thesis with me. And then she went to work in the lab of this guy you might have once heard about. His name is Jack DeVidio at Yale. So she did it. And now she's a postdoc, and she's going to be out on the market. Um, 
And the other person is Juan Madera. Juan Madera is like a son to me. Um, Juan graduated from California State University, Dominguez Hills. When he applied to our program, people in our program, uh, faculty who are no longer there, said, no, that's, I don't think so. Um, he didn't have a lot of prep in the classes, but he had a lot of potential. He did, he had a 3.9. It wasn't necessarily known how this university would compare with the universities that we most likely accept, we're more likely to accept students from. And when he took stats, he failed stats. If you fail it twice, you get kicked out of our program. So this was a highly stressful situation for him. He did a mediocre thesis. Um, and after that, he something clicked in his third or fourth year. And Juan retook stats, and he became an absolute expert in, this, in stats. To this day, I go to Juan for my stats questions. He is now a tenured professor and almost a full professor at University of Houston. Um, he is an award, a teaching award winner. He is a researcher with 45 publications to his name, and he's one of my favorite collaborators to this day. My point in telling you this story is that I hope each of you as teachers welcome, respect, and appreciate diversity in the classroom. There is simply bigotry and low expectations. So even though it may be a long shot, the payoffs in taking students that sometimes make us think differently or sometimes require us to behave in ways that may not be normal or may take um, us out of our comfort zone can be so fulfilling. To this day, Juan has mentored 46 students of his own. So if you think of the rippling effects you can have by not having bigotry and by accepting diversity, it's pretty incredible. Next student is Carrie Loughran. And I'm a marathon runner, so I've run a marathon in every state. I've never won one yet. And uh, I, at the time, would say, to, I've run a lot of marathons with students. Okay, I love, I have a passion for running, hence the name of this talk. And so I used to run marathon. I still run marathons with students, so there's a couple in this room that I've run marathons with. And Carrie was an undergraduate, and she wanted to run a marathon. So she was a senior, and she said, I want to do a marathon. And I said, well, you pick a state that I haven't done a marathon in, and we'll do that marathon. That would be great. And so she said, Arizona. Now, I said, that's fine. That we'll do Arizona. She said, no, I'm not a very good runner. I'm kind of slow. And I said, that's great. We did it during the holiday season. It was, uh, I think, December 15th or something. And I knew I was going to have to coach her. Now, you need to also know that in order for the marathon to count for the state, you have to finish it in six hours. I'll just tell you, you can almost walk one in, in six hours and 30 minutes or maybe seven hours. So <clears throat> this seemed doable. So I said, OK, so I'm going to coach you through this. And we're going to do this Arizona marathon. Now, Carrie is really religious. She's. Um, uh, actually, right now, she is um, working in London, and she just produced a religious show that she hopes will make to Broadway. So she's a very accomplished, she was a, a PR person first who traveled with Oprah Winfrey, and now she's doing her own writing. So she's really kind of a unique person with a, a career that's uh, not like ac the academicians that I'm talking mostly about. So Carrie says, now here's what I want you to do, is if, if the going gets tough, I want you to read some verses to me. And she put them in my hand, and these verses were things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, whatever. So 
I have these verses, and I start by I'm a little bit of a heathen Catholic feminist, okay? So I start by singing 100 bottles of beer on the wall and singing Christmas songs. And what happens when you run a marathon is you really want to do it till you get to the 21, 22-mile mark, and then your personality changes, and you get kind of mean. And so she looks over at me, and I'm like, singing the songs. I mean, we are going at a pace that is slow, and I'm like, jingle bells, <laughs> and a hundred bottles. She looks over, and she goes, stop it. And I said, okay, okay, I can do all things through Christ. <laughs> and so we go through all of these, you know, prayers, and she's like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to stop. And I go, no, you can't stop. Okay, now I'm starting to feel a little stressed because we're at around the 22 mile mark and she and we're we've taken some hours. We're at about 5 hours and 20 minutes. And she says, no, I really want to stop. And so I, I realize that the prayers are getting old, the bottle of beers are getting old. So I go, look, look out toward the mountains. God is in the mountains. God is calling you. Run to God. Okay. And she's like, all right, I'm running. And then she says, I don't feel very good. And I said, run to God. And so <laughs> she collapses right there. Okay, she collapses. I'm like, oh, my shit. I should not have, I'm not a preacher. <laughs> so I get her, and her eyes are like, oh. And so I go, okay, okay, don't just stay there. Luckily, it was right by a water station. Um, so the people come over. She gets up again. She's like, I think I, I need to run again. I'm like, no, no, now you can't run. So she throws up. She is there not feeling good, and so it's clear she's done. She's gonna, once you throw up, you're dehydrated. There's all Her electrolytes were off, so she's done. So they put her in a <clears throat> paddy wagon to go to the end of the race where I'm going to meet her. But i got to finish my race because i got to get the medal because I don't want to come back and do it because I've been running for now. It's like five hours and 50 seconds, and I have a mile left. Okay, now you might go, well, that's a 10-minute mile. That's easy. But I've been running for five hours and 50 minutes dancing around this person, and I got nothing left. So I'm giving it my all, okay? And people are, like, looking at me like, okay, loser girl, you don't have to run that fast, okay, because I was running past all these walkers. So I finally get to the end, and I make it. I get, like, a 558. It was super close. <clears throat> and I get a medal, and I say, can I get another medal for my friend? And they said, sure. And so I go to the first aid tent, and I see Carrie lying there. And I look at her, and she's got a medal around her neck. And I said, oh, where'd you get that medal? And she said, wow, when I got to the, near the finish line, I told that paddy wagon, I said, you let me off this, this bus, and I'm going to run across the finish line. And so she ran across the finish line. And I said, so you mean your time is better than mine? <laughs> and indeed, it was, OK? So what I want to say is sometimes the students deserve the medal, darn it. Now, it makes me stop to tell you another thing about running, just because I like to share this, too. So I don't know if you know a lot about running. But people like to put onto their, how many of you have run a, at least a 5K? OK, so a lot of you. So you have these little like bibs that you put on. And when you get to like kind of marathons or some of the bibs, the, you can actually put your name on them, OK? And so you can put Go Mickey. And then people watch you, and they'll go, Go Mickey, you know, or James, Go James, OK? And then sometimes they'll put like a number that you have a number, or they'll put, I want to get a 320, or I want to go to 415, usually so that they can come to this very place and run the Boston Marathon. So for guys, the number is often, at the time, it was 315 for the age group I was in, and for women, it's 340. And so one of the things I noticed uh, at one of the marathons was that there were a ton of people, this is when I first moved down to Texas, I noticed this, uh, that had John 316 on it. And I thought, 
Now, why in the hell does John want to run a 316? Why wouldn't he want to run a 315? Okay, and of course, yeah, so that's for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, and these people were all paying tribute. All right, so you can tell, Baylor was a very educational place for me. Next one is Gina Ingersoll. Gina was a research assistant in my lab for three years, and she took many different classes with me. In her senior year, she wanted to do a thesis. She did it with my wonderful colleague, uh, Jeffrey Potts, and uh, she worked in the psychology department office. Uh, after Rice, she planned to get her PhD in clinical psychology. She married another psychologist in the department, and about five years after graduation, she probably worked in my lab four semesters, I think, uh, three years. Um, and five years after graduation, I learned that Gina had committed suicide. And I went to the funeral home and I saw Gina in the coffin. And I looked at her and I just stared. As you can see, she's a beautiful woman. And she was 28 years old. She was the same age that I was when I started at Rice. And I felt so sad and so extremely depressed. Um, I wished that I had followed up on her. I wished that I had asked her, you know, can I write you a letter? What are you doing? Um, you know, are you going to go back to graduate school? I wish I could have helped her with the pain that she had apparently experienced. And I think about Gina still, like she's a student I won't forget until the very end of my life. Um, and it's because Gina um, reminds me that there are problems that so many of us and our students have. They're vulnerable. Uh, we get to see them on the surface and what we don't see, so we see them maybe doing well or saying something good in our class or struggling, but we often forget what the layers are of their lives and how they have vulnerabilities, uh, they have their post-adolescent crises, uh, they have eating disorders, they have relationships gone awry, they have family issues and insecurities they're dealing with. And many of us don't go there because we're not clinical psychologists, we don't have the time, we don't have the psychological space, we don't have the fortitude. And I think it makes me realize that life uh, is so incredibly precious and also that these students we teach are so vulnerable. They have personal issues and if there's any way to infuse life lessons into teaching, what a wonderful thing that is. And maybe we just need to entwine more of life lessons and more of, you know, we failed too. So we often get up in front of people and they see us because we're award winners. They don't see, they see our vitas. They don't see something I called the anti-vita. That's all the awards you applied for and didn't get, all the schools that rejected you, all of the papers that went to 12 journals before, five journals before it got accepted at one. And, you know, the students looking up at us think they can't be us, and we need to reach down to them and be aware of their vulnerabilities. So another lesson is to assume that student vol uh, vulnerability. Now, the last um, story is about two of my closest friends in life, in the field and in life. The utter joy of sharing the field um, my passion for psychology and love of diversity and discrimination research and of running together. So with Eden King, I have probably run six marathons. And with Janessa Shapiro, I have to tell you, I ran one. And I'm going to tell you a story about Janessa. Janessa was a student at Arizona State. And she was a person who ran the same marathon that Carrie, a few slides back, ran. Only Janessa decided that she was going to run the race two nights before the race. And she hadn't trained. In fact, the longest she had run was five miles. So, but she is really in shape and she decided she'd do this. So we get together at the pasta dinner where they're doing these humorous give awards out. And actually, I think they had a whole lot of extra cliff bars and things like that. <laughs> and they were just trying to get rid of them so they didn't have to pack them up. So they're like, well, we're going to give this one, this box, to the person who trained the most. 
And somebody's like, oh, I run, whatever, 25 miles a day. And we're all, oh, okay. And now we're going to give this box to the individual who trained the least. And so we're all like, Janessa, okay? So they say, you know, Janessa, how long have you trained? What's the longest you've done? And she says, I did a, a, a seven-mile race, a seven-mile run. And we're like, no, you didn't. You only did a five-mile. And she goes, shh, I don't want them to think that I didn't train. <laughs> we're like, whatever. <laughs> okay, so after I hobbled in in 558, about a half hour later, we see Janessa, and she's coming here like this, and she's got a bandana around her knee, and she's sore, but she's made it. She's done the marathon, okay? So anyway, it's really been a privilege. These two are two of my very closest friends. Eden is uh, one of my graduate students. She was one of my former uh, undergrads and my graduate student, and she's a powerhouse in the field of IO psychology. We just did a, we, we did a coup and we hired her away from George Mason. So this best friend of mine in life is going to come join uh, me as a colleague. And I, I feel like the world is aligned and good things are happening. And I look so forward to watching her continued success. I predict one day she'll be a president of PSYOP one day soon. And I hope that she's the president of APS. She's so wonderfully good. Um, the other person is Janessa Shapiro, and Janessa Shapiro and Eden King, not surprisingly, are very, very close friends. Um, Janessa married uh, somebody at Arizona State, Noah Goldstein, and he and she were the power couple to hire, so they were looked at uh, by so many different people, and they decided to go to UCLA together. Janessa was diagnosed with stage four metastatic cancer. And so she um, is now going through trial after trial. And it is about the most unfair thing I can think of in life to happen to such a wonderful person. We refer to her um, as Susie Lou. Lou Who, the smallest Who of Whoville, who is that one individual who changes the Grinch's mind. That's the goodness that's in her. And so what these two have taught me is that it's really important to enjoy the mile or marathon you get to share with students. And it is really the case that these students are sometimes like our children. They're sometimes our best collaborators. And sometimes, just sometimes, they become our best friends in life. So um, to recap, what I hope that you got out of this talk is, one, you have the power to change lives, and the cow patties are waiting for you. Um, come to Jesus talks can really work. You can, Margaret will probably be here after this talk if you need some advice on exactly how best to give them. Uh, three, you don't always know which students you influence. Um, four, welcome, respect, and marvel at diversity. There is real bigotry and low expectations. Five, uh, sometimes students deserve the medal. Darn it. I guess I decided there should be another five. So assume student vulnerability. And finally, the privilege of sharing a mile with a student is, is the best gift that the field gives to me, and I think probably to you as well, although it may not be a mile, it may be some other metaphor. And what we do get is sometimes, just sometimes, the privilege of sharing a lifetime marathon with them. So thank you very much for letting me give this talk, and uh, uh, thank you.